Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's edition of What's So Funny. And now we have this week a fantastic guest, stand-up comedian extraordinaire who's made his way back to Vancouver. It's the one and only Chuck Byrne. And now your host, the vanguard of comedy, print, journalism in Vancouver and podcasting himself, it's Guy McPherson. Oh, go on. Go no. on, Sam. Go on. Hey, thanks. Uh, this is week three of my cold. Welcome to it. It's, uh, I believe, I'm at the tail end of it. Chuck Byrne is our guest. Chuck, uh, last here in 2011. At a Has it been that long? Yeah, it's been a while. Wow. You were here as part of a comedy roundtable. We had Dylan Reimer, we had Toby Hargrave, and Steve Bays, and yourself. Yeah. Yeah, we're at the old location, and we're moving back to that location next week. Yeah. So you're the last guest in this room. Wonderful. I believe I also closed. Uh, I've closed a few comedy clubs in my time too. <laughs> Have you? <laughs> I was the I was the last one to perform at uh, one of the versions of Yuck Yucks Montreal at one point. Oh, did, and did you know at the time? Uh, no. Right. Well, so you couldn't do anything. Well, I real I didn't know specifically, but. Um, you know, if you'd done any kind of forensic testing on the club, <laughs> yeah. you would you would have been able to know that it was not long for the world. <laughs> right. Well, that's uh, Canadian comedy, right? Well, Co- yeah, rooms come and go. Nothing's forever. Nothing is forever. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for coming. It's been a long time. Uh, we finally made it happen because you, a Vancouverite... A true Vancouverite. What what makes you true Vancouverite? My grandparents live were, in my grandparents. My grandparents were born in this town. Oh, okay. all of them, all, all four. All four of my grandparents were born wow. in this town. And then you were born, and you grew up. What what neighborhood? I grew up on the west side, kind of all over. We mm-hmm. we moved around a lot because I think my dad was. Uh, Trying to work the '70s real estate market in Vancouver, <laughs> not 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 quite not quite not what quite it is. as pr- as profitable as it is now. Hey. But uh, what schools did you go to? I went to Shaughnessy Elementary School, and then I went to Vancouver College. Oh, the private school. Well, I uh, I went to Vancouver. It was it was I think the Catholic uh, part of it was more important to my mother than the private part was right. important. That's a fine school. It was a fine school. Purple and gold are their colors. They're the Fighting Irish. And, oh, um, you don't need to tell me, Chuck. They only lost about 12% of their staff to uh, court battles. Oh, jeez. Whoa. <laughs> Is that <laughs> true? Right. Okay. Well, no, I don't know. Oh. That's not true at all. But, uh, <laughs> but a few folks had to go back to Newfoundland to testify. Oh, man. <laughs> Were you involved in that at all? Uh, what was I touching kids? No, well. I was touching myself a fair bit back then, go. but uh, <laughs> you didn't have to testify about it. I that. did not have to testify just in the about... confessional booth, yeah. Well, even then, I kind of skirted the truth a little bit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What'd you say? I'm not going to go into what I told my priest. Come on, <laughs> oh. do you still go to confession? No, yeah. I just try to live an honest life. When was the last time you went to confession? Uh, I honestly couldn't tell you. It, it would be more than a quarter century ago. Yeah. Yeah. I I was an altar boy. Oh, yeah. I was. Uh, I believe I probably went to confession the the number of times you had to do it for Sunday school. So probably once, maybe twice. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. As a kid. And it was, it was just like I didn't listen to my mom. And Yeah. It yeah. was it would be a petty, petty kid crimes. Yeah. I don't know the punishment. I, I mean, I, I, I don't argue with, with the idea that confession is good for the soul and uh, hanging, hanging on to stuff can uh, corrode. Well, isn't it just like going to see a therapist and talking I think about your a, problems? I, I think ideally it is. Ideally. ideally, it's not just a laundry list of I did these things wrong and so therefore please give me whatever punishments are appropriate, uh, but talking out, you know. Mm-hmm. And, I th- and I think... I would imagine many many priests do it like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and is this where you got your uh, your favorite expression, "Dear Lord in Heaven"? That's one of my favorite expressions. <laughs> I know. Have you heard it? Well, I, I don't watch my clips, so you probably are more aware of what I say than I am. There's, there's, uh, "Dear Lord in Heaven" is one of my favorites because uh, it's kind of folksy in mm-hmm. its way. Yeah, I, I like those anachronistic uh, yeah. expressions. So do I. And um, especially if you're, I find using using a phrase like that when you're talking about a subject that isn't quite as wholesome is very effective. Yeah. Yeah. It's like talking about something that's very crude in a very clean way. 
I find is 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 much more effective. Effective uh, on stage comedically. Yeah, yeah, and in co- and in conversation. Yeah. I find if uh, you know if you if you're trying to make a point with somebody, if you can make a point in a make your point in a non-aggressive way, or at least a seemingly non-aggressive way, um, your point's much much more likely to be received. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But but also it's just not doing what everybody else is doing as well and that yeah. makes people sit up and notice. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, he's talking about something filthy in kind of an elevated way. Yeah. Yeah. Or or vice versa. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a, I mean I mean there's plenty of ex- Seinfeld Seinfeld's great you know thing was he he'd like to specifically talk about a subject without ever actually saying the word. You know, like they skirted around it. They did the masturbation sure, episode. Yeah, yeah. That's and, the one and, you know, I was they skirt, yeah, and they skirted around it and stuff like that. I just find is kind of brilliant because uh, certainly from a from a comedic point of view and a writer's point of view, when you watch something like that, you can really appreciate how delicate they are being with the language. And I think the audience appreciates that much more when you're when 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 they can see that you're being careful. Um, you kind of move them to the edge of their seat on will he make a mistake and slip up. Mm-hmm. And also they get to feel uh, like they're in on it a little bit because they know what you're talking about, even though you haven't said it. Yes. Good. And, and so you started out uh, comedy here in Vancouver, 1994. Yeah. I know this. <laughs> uh, 1994. So I was here then, and uh, I don't... I don't know. Like you moved away pretty quick, didn't you? I moved away. Uh, I went on a, a, an Eastern tour at the uh, end of August of '96. I headed out east, and I did a tour uh, for about four months, and it was the longest I had, longest stretch of comedy I had ever done. Um, just club every week. I worked every single week, and and back then they had a lot of a lot of shows beyond the clubs, so you were doing one nighters on the nights that the clubs weren't open and stuff like that. So Eastern Maritimes, you're talking? I did the full, I did every, every everything that, I was working for Yuck at, at the time. and um, Two and years into your career. Two years in. Yeah. And I did pretty much every gig they had. And I showed up as a guy who had worked in BC uh, and had been working. So I was new, but I had a, I had an act. Um, I wasn't just fresh off of amateur night. I yeah. had, I, you were new to them. I was new to them. I was new to their crowd, and 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 for them, they were you know they're always happy when somebody who shows up who's new it, is competent. That's really all they're looking right. for. They don't need you to be a superstar, that a superstar or anything like that. Just if you're competent, you can you can do your time, and people will laugh, and nobody's complaining yeah. about you. You're saying the the clubs need that from somebody who's new. Everybody needs everybody. it. Yeah, everybody needs it. But but the it, I mean the bookers. I mean the, the reason why. I mean originally I was supposed to go out. I think for two months, and 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 I and I told them you know I'll I'll stay if there's more work. And I was doing a fairly decent job. I was taking it very seriously. Were you were you headlining? Were you featuring? No, I was just middling. middling I was middling, yeah. and and by the end of that tour, I started emceeing, and uh, and a few co-feature shows, which I. Really, probably shouldn't have been co-featuring. Um, I was still too new, um, but I had the material just because I I wrote a lot. I was told on my first amateur night, I said, "How much time do I need before someone will pay me to do this?" Mm-hmm. And I was told an absolute minimum of twenty minutes. So the first four amateur nights that I ever did, I did a different five minutes each time. Boom! There's your twenty, Fig- and that's exactly <laughs> what I figured is, hey, I got twenty minutes, and because I had a car. I was like a guy with 20 minutes in a car. You know, you, you're in show business now. If you got 20 minutes in a car, you can, you're able to drive the guy who can actually do a show yeah. to the show. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I and that's what I did for that first two years. I drove yeah. a lot of head, headliners it, around the province. Does this just, still work that way? Young kids out there listening, have a car, um, have a few jokes. So it depends where you live. I mean, living in Toronto, having a car. Might not be quite as as important as BC. I mean, the the thing about Vancouver as a as a geographically for comedy is you're isolated. Yeah. Because you need you need population uh, in order because you know you just need more stages, more uh, you know more clubs, more rooms, more more whatever. And the, and and where Toronto benefits is that within three hours of Toronto, 
is 60% of the people who speak English in our country. Is it that high? Or is I don't know if it's that okay. high. But, but that, it feels that, like that, it. That seems like the right number. <laughs> sure. Right? I mean, we live, we live in the post-truth era. So all of these statistics, yeah. you know, somebody might ask their phone. But Good, my, good point. Yeah. Yeah. So within two years, you are on tour, and then you you just stayed. at the at the end of that tour, uh, I asked um, the guy who was the booker at Yuck Yucks at the time, Evan Edelman, out there, out there. Yeah. He was the in the Toronto head office, and I asked him. I said, "Hey, if I move out here, will there be work?" And he said, "Well, what do you mean?" And, and because nobody wants to commit to anything, and and I said, "Well, I'm not going to pack a bag and move across the country unless there's work for me. I'll figure myself out in Vancouver rather than moving all the way out to Toronto and not working." And, and he was honest with me. He said, "You know what? Um, if you do the job that you've been doing, and you take it seriously, and you don't screw up, yeah, there will be work for you. There's work for anyone in any business if they're willing to work hard and get the job done, which is a, a fairly honest statement and a fairly. I, I thought it was a fairly true statement, and he stayed to his word. You know, he you, he worked me a lot. Now I wasn't making a ton of money, but I was working a lot. Yeah, and then I was fortunate enough. Within a year of being in Toronto, I started booking commercials and stuff like that. So then those help on the money end. You do a lot of commercials? Uh, not anymore. Um, I did then. Yeah. Yeah. The Pillsbury Toaster, Toaster Strudel. Toaster Strudel. Uh, yeah. uh, a National few. campaign. That was, that, was a, uh, that was my first taste of what it was like for someone to recognize you from television. Oh, yeah? Because, you know, the Can Canada, we're a pretty small town. Yeah, and uh, if you're in a national commercial, it means you're playing on every single television in the country. Yeah, especially what year are we talking about? This would have been ninety six, ninety seven. Yeah, people maybe, were watching maybe, maybe, TV then. Maybe into ninety eight. Yeah, it ran for a long time because what they did is they it was the thing for Toaster Strudel, and I think I did two two commercials with them, and then and then it went off air. And then they brought the commercial back and added one small line to the end of it. Now in chocolate, Perfect. and but because they added that line, they had to pay me again, as if they I had shot a brand new commercial for them because it had been off air and someone at the union had negotiated that at some point years before I arrived. And so Ka-ching. that ended up being like a two year run of. Pretty decent cash. Was that you saying now in chocolate? No, had nothing to do with me. Nothing to I do with you. Got a call from my agent. <laughs> hey, you're back on TV. But that was the first time where where like people at shows when I was doing stand up were yelling out, "Hey, you're the you're the Strudel guy, Strudel boy." Or actually, most of the time they called me Pop Tart guy, and I always had to correct them. <laughs> no, which it's a toaster. Really Strudel. annoyed the hell out of me. <laughs> I got a question for you, Chuck. Sure. When you were uh... twelve inches. Yeah. There that's, we go. That's a <laughs> circumference. <laughs> when you were had your your twenty minutes in a car, you were out here in BC, right? Yep. Who, who were the headliners you were working with? Uh, Anyone stand out? You know. Well, there was a, there was a few of them. Uh, let's see if I can remember the first the first little run I did is I did uh, Fraser Lake, Prince George, and Quinnell. That was the first first weekend of comedy I'd ever been booked on in my life, and. Uh, I believe that was with a guy named Dan Gascon. Okay. And then I did um, a tour through BC, um, like a complete tour through BC, uh, that was booked by Dave Copeman, who used to run Laugh Yeah, sure he's back at it now. Yeah, and, and he booked me with this American guy, Mark Lundholm, who was a really fascinating guy as a stand-up comic. Hmm. I don't um, know him. Cause, well, he had, been doing, he had been doing comedy a while, and then his whole life got washed out on him. Uh, he was an alcoholic, and he rebuilt his life. And he had two different shows that he did. He had his stand-up show where he acknowledged that he was an alcoholic, and he had some funny stories about that. And then he also had a 12-step show that he did just for the recovery audience. Ah, and that's actually, that's actually the show he first started doing. When he first started performing, nobody would hire him. So he was doing shows at halfway houses and stuff like that, and that's how he got his stage time. But I did a I did a run with him. We did all through the interior of BC and onto Vancouver Island, and uh, and we got about three days into it. We were having a lot of fun. We were laughing in the car, having a great time. We got about three days into it, and uh, and I said to him one morning after 
you know, after the third gig or whatever, which had not gone well for me. And, and, uh, and I was kind of getting used to doing pretty good because I'm a salesman. You know, I got a nice round doughy face and I'm willing to smile at you and I'm friendly <laughs> and I want you to laugh. That's, I, that's what I need from you. I need you to laugh to fill the darkness inside me, right? That's <laughs> okay. the whole reason I'm here is I need that. Please give me your laughter so that I can, you know, sleep yeah. at night. And, <laughs> and it hadn't gone well for me. And the next morning in the car, I'm sitting there and I'm all kind of depressed and down. And, and I said to him, I said, you know, if you see mistakes I'm making, let me know. And it was the smartest thing I ever said to anybody because he wasn't judgmental. He didn't try to make me into the kind of comedian that he was. All he did is he started pointing things out to me. Sim simple things that I hadn't been paying attention to and looking for. Like, he's, he's, the first thing he said to me is, stop asking them questions. Good. You're talking to a crowd that isn't really listening. These were bar crowds, right? So they're, they're not really listening to the opener that much. And, you know, how's everybody doing tonight? Or asking, you know, general questions to the audience. Is a way, as, as, as a comedian, you're just checking to see if they're listening. Mm. But really, the the thing is 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 what he what he what he showed me is don't ask anything of them other than to enjoy themselves, the, you know. Like and, and to this day, now uh, on the other side of it, when I see somebody asking the audience questions, it drives me nuts. Like every t every time, and it hasn't happened for a while because because he's no longer with us. But Steve Irwin, Steve Irwin was a uh, a hot topic for a lot of comics because people love doing the impression and he was kind of crazy and he got to pretend you're getting bitten by a snake on stage, you know, that kind of thing. And everybody who had a Steve Irwin bit always started, about, you, are you familiar with this guy? Do you know who he is, the yeah. crocodile hunter? <laughs> and the honest answer is, it doesn't fucking matter. Does it matter? Thank you. It doesn't matter yeah. at all because if, if everyone in the audience in unison said, no, we don't know who the crocodile hunter is, would you still do the joke? I've seen comedians bail yeah, from, said, a, from I've, a bit because people didn't know because something. Because people don't know and how to talk about it. And I've told them. But that's the point. Craft, just explain it to craft them. Craft the joke in such a way that it's irrelevant if they know him or, or not. That's right. It's a you funny know? voice. And and also, <laughs> but I mean, as I've done more, more and more thinking about stuff like this, because I think about stuff like this a lot, is anyone who doesn't know who the crocodile hunter is. The 10% of your crowd that doesn't know the answer to your question is now alienated from the group. They're not part of that same audience anymore. They're a subsection of the audience. Mm -hmm. There's a cooler part of the audience mm -hmm. than them. And you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're just hurting your own progress because you need them to be a team who are all together, all on the same side, enjoying the show. The, the, the audience is so critical to how... Stand up works, you know. If they love you, if they hate you, either way, perfect. If they're indifferent, or if they're kind of like, yeah, whatever, you're dead. That's some great advice. Our guest uh, is Chuck Byrne, Toronto's Chuck Byrne. No, I'm still, still Vancouver. Okay, <laughs> Vancouver's Chuck Byrne. The show is What's So Funny on CFRO 100.5 FM in Vancouver. I'm Guy McPherson. Sam Tonning is right across from me. That's me. And uh, Chuck, you, you mentioned uh, you got this great advice as a youngster starting out. Uh, and now do, do young comics come up to you and say, am I doing anything wrong? Are you passing on your words? Uh, I will always answer questions if asked. The, the Calgary Club used to do a thing on their amateur night where, where uh, who, whoever the headliner was in town um, would, would do – a shorter set at the end of the amateur night, but before the show would also do, and Toronto did this as well, kind of a, I don't know, a sit-down talk with the amateurs. Whoever was on the show that night was welcome to come and basically ask the headliner questions. Before the crowd gets Before in. the crowd. Yeah. And, and the thing that I used to say to them is, uh, if you would like me to watch your set critically... Like, watch your set and really see what you're doing from, from a comedian point of view, not a, hey, I thought you were funny, but this is what you're doing. This is what you're doing right. This is what you're doing wrong. Um, tell me before the show. Tell me that you would really like me to pay attention to your set, and I will happily do it. Because when you're new, you need input. You need to know what you're doing right and wrong. And I found about maybe 20% of them would actually huh. want to know. Because I also would tell them, I'm going to tell you honestly. 
So if you go up there and you know dig like a hole, constructively dig, probably too. I'm gonna. Tr- I'm not gonna try to be mean to people. Yeah. Because that's not my style. But I. I. I told people that they should not be doing comedy. Really? Yeah. Based on what? What do you see from somebody that just? I. I told. Lets, I told lets you write them. I off. told an amateur. I didn't write them off, but I told an amateur comic who who. You know, his goal was he wanted to be a professional comic. I made it clear to him that I didn't think that was going to happen. And the reason I didn't think it was, and, you know, well, there was a few reasons I didn't think it was going to happen was because he was talking about subjects that everyone's already talked about. He had nothing nothing about himself in his show at all and uh, and no real opinions on anything. And so he was just, he was making, um, I call it the first thought problem is when you when a news event happens everyone has their first every comedian has the first joke that they write about it well 90% of the comedians wrote the same joke you know like if you're complaining that that someone stole your Donald Trump is orange joke quit because everybody wrote that joke mm-hmm. so it's not yours it's your first thought and anybody can come up with that first thought. Bus drivers will come up with that first thought. Everybody will come up with that joke. Non-professional comedians, non-professional funny people, people who have never, people that don't really have much of a sense of humor will come up with that joke because it's the first logical place to make fun of. And where comics do well is finding the angles that don't occur to people. Yeah. And and if if every if every angle you have is the most common angle, I don't think you have a long-term future in comedy just because you're not bringing anything to the audience that they would that couldn't have occurred to them on their own. The late great Irwin Barker. Oh, I did a BC run with Irwin Barker too. <laughs> did you? That was my third one, and that was probably the funniest week of my life. Just in the car. In the car, everywhere. Yeah, but I was just going to say he, on this program, he said uh, he had a great analogy about what you were just talking about. He said a comedian's job, I guess, uh, paraphrasing, this was many years ago, is to if you're looking for an object, most people once they find the object will stop looking. He said a comedian's <laughs> job is to keep looking even after you've found yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah. this is kind of what because you're saying. Because there's there's probably a better set of keys out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So just uh, have the first thought and then build on that, but don't make the first thought public. I guess is what. Well, you're just saying. don't make the first thought the linchpin of your act. <laughs> okay, right? Like, don't make the first thing that you know, like the, the the first the first bad guy that Stephen King thinks of isn't the one he writes the seven hundred page novel about. You know, he digs a little deeper. Yeah, and and that's what you have to so, do. So you told this guy you shouldn't be doing comedy. I did, no, I didn't say you should. I I never tell people they shouldn't be doing comedy because there's plenty of people that do comedy that have no interest in being professional comics. Right. There was a comic in Vancouver for years, and I, I will not mention the name, but this individual did this every single time I saw this person on Amateur Night. They did the exact same. Five minutes, mm-hmm. same timing, same pacing, same everything. Did fairly well with it. If you'd asked this person to do six minutes, there'd be a minute of silence. <laughs> but there was no interest there in being a professional comedian. This person just wanted to perform and just wanted to enjoy being on stage, telling a joke, and having people laugh at it. And nothing wrong with that, just as an outlet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but the, the person that you did tell, However, you I just, yeah, I how, just, how did they take that? They were hurt, and did they, and that person was Jim Carrey, ladies and gentlemen. No, <laughs> no, no I've got person... an interest. I, I do have a Jim Carrey story, though. <laughs> oh, I, I uh, in in ninety seven, might have been ninety eight. Uh, it was right around when Jim was doing Liar Liar. Yeah, uh, Wayne Fleming, uh, another comedian who's passed. It's, it's Dead Guy Night. Uh, Wayne Fleming was staying uh, with myself. Uh, my roommate was Johnny Guardhouse, and so Wayne was staying with us uh, in Toronto for a few days. And uh, and Wayne was kind of Jim's mentor early days when Jim was in Toronto. Wayne was kind of you know Uncle Wayne. Okay. And uh, and they remained good friends until Wayne's death a couple of years ago, I would imagine. And you know Jim, I think. Uh, uh, Wayne did a couple of uh, cameos 
in, in Jim Carrey movies. And this was really when Jim Carrey was was the hottest comedian anyone had ever seen. Mm-hmm. He was the he was the twenty or thirty or forty or whatever million dollar man he was at that point. And Wayne had told us earlier in the evening, you know, Jim's going to be calling tonight. Well, Jim's going to be calling. Just so you know, if the phone rings, it's probably going to be Jim Carrey. And there's right? a landline there. And, and Wayne was a little bit of a name dropper, too. Yeah. So he was really happy that Jim was going to be calling him at someone else's house so that, you know, you know, Jim Carrey called my house, right? Now I'm telling the story about how <laughs> Wayne is well connected. Like, you know, that's how it works. And uh, and it was landline. And it was landline. And... um and we had been into uh, we had been into the marijuana a little bit that evening. Whoa! And so uh, we we had a little bit of a laugh going on. And around I don't know one o'clock in the morning, the phone rings, and I pick it up, and it's uh, yeah. Can I speak to Wayne Fleming? It's Jim Carrey calling, and it was a voice that was full of. The confidence that you would have if somebody paid you $40 million yeah. to work for three weeks on a follow-up to a movie <laughs> where you talk out of your ass. <laughs> and uh, well-deserved, in my opinion. Um, and just on instinct. It was one of those things where someone gives you the opening and all of a sudden you say the line. You haven't had a thought about the line. You've just said the line right back to him. It's like you know, hitting a tennis shot out of fear. Yeah. And, um, and as soon as he said, is Jim Carrey calling, I said to him... You know what? I'm willing to bet this hasn't happened to you in a while, and I hung up on him. <laughs> and because who's who's hanging up on Jim Carrey? Yeah. Right? But it means nothing to me because you know, what's he going to do for me? He doesn't know me. He doesn't, it's irrelevant. And what? And, and what's Wayne, Wayne doing? Yeah. Wayne loses his mind. He's terrified. What are you doing? Hanging up on my famous friend? And I tell him he's calling back. He's like, what do you mean he's calling back? He's your friend. Of course he's calling you back. <laughs> sure enough, 30 seconds later, the phone rings, and I answer it. Hello. Uh, yes, may I please speak to Wayne Fleming? Yes, can I tell him who's calling? Uh, it's his friend, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> they got smoke and everything was fine, and I got a Jim Carrey story out there of There you deal. go. You got it. And you mentioned uh, going on tour with Irwin. And the oh, best Irwin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we went... Um, uh, the night that I always remember is we went from uh, um, Smithers, we did a show, and then the next night we were in Prince Rupert, and uh, and Irwin got on stage in Prince Rupert, and 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 if you don't know Irwin, Irwin is is um, he's often called kind of the absent-minded professor. He doesn't look necessarily like a comedian. He doesn't not, sound not at all. Let's necessarily say. like a comedian. <laughs> you know, he had a rumpled sport coat and dress pants and and shoes. And most of the time, I think he would wear a tie or at least yeah. a, at least a dress shirt. And uh, but he was a little bit disheveled, right? And he had glasses, and he would push his glasses up his nose a lot, and just mm-hmm. you know, kind of reorganizing himself continuously without ever really managing to be organized. You know, he, he was a guy that was extremely smart, but I don't know if he wanted to or not. He certainly gave the impression that a lot of things were just occurring to him when he had thought them out well in advance. Right. And uh, and the, the one line that stuck with me is, uh, he, you know, he, he I introduced him and he was like, oh, you know, Chuck, Chuck, everybody, you know, and they, they did a great job. And uh, I'll tell you, we, we didn't know if we were gonna get here we had a had a lot of trouble with the with the car well not really with the car with the with the with the tv uh from the hotel last night it just it wouldn't quite fit into chuck's car so we really had to hammer it in <laughs> and and just the way i'm not doing it justice enough, the way he said that to a to a, to a bar gig in, yeah. in prince rupert cut everybody like all of a sudden everybody in the room didn't see the this guy doesn't look like us he doesn't sound like us anymore Everyone in the room just saw this guy's funny, he and for the guy. rest of the show, yeah. that's what it was. Was it every it was, time? Because he was sitting in a room full of lumberjacks and and hippies who pick mushrooms in the summer, and it, they were his crowd. Yeah, I, I I said that he's a guy who kills no matter what the audience is. Sometimes I would be slightly afraid for him, going, "Oh, this is a really young, boisterous crowd," and they all loved him. If they if if he could get them to listen, yeah, that was the biggest. It was the only issue that he had to deal with. Is yeah. is it, it, uh, and there was only one of our shows that we did on that tour. We did a show in Whistler, and 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 it was all um, bar staff. It was staff night, and they were young and they were 
by the time the show started, everybody was hammered. <laughs> and right before the show started, Irwin said to me, you know what? You close this. And he went up, and they just kind of heckled him for about a half hour. Mm-hmm. They weren't really listening to him. They didn't get him. They didn't give him. If they'd given him three minutes, right, they would have understood. Oh, okay, we yeah. should listen to this guy. But they didn't even give him that. And then I went up after him, and then and basically just yelled at them for <laughs> for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, uh, Sam asked about who you started uh, oh, out we, with, and and I know there was Tim Nutt. Tim Nutt, who I, I I I had lunch with today. Oh, was he, oh, he's in town. He was he was on his way out of town, but since, yeah. since I knew he was in town last night, and where, and you started. I know there was Glenn Wool. Glenn Wool. Ian yep. Bag was around. Ian Bag. I did I did a, uh, a another run with Ian Bag, <laughs> and I sounded like him. Did you? For about three months afterwards, <laughs> he, burn. Yeah, he's just—he's got a very specific cadence. Yeah, and 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 I was new enough at comedy that w- just spending that much time with him, all of a sudden, you just start to sound like, and right. it drove me nuts <laughs> because that's it, you just you, uh, stealing someone's cadence that's is right. way worse than stealing their joke. Right. Yeah. And, and Kevin Fox, I believe. Kevin Fox. Yeah, Kevin yeah. Fox. Uh, Dave Evil. Uh, I don't know Dave. Evil. I don't know if Dave Dave's still Evil. Does. That's a name I haven't heard in a while. Yeah, well, oh, you've heard it sticks it. with you. Dave. Dave has a joke that I will do tonight because I get to credit him. Yeah, sure. And it's the only joke I've ever wanted to steal. <laughs> and it's uh, you know the only time you're not lying to the cops is when you called them. It's <laughs> <laughs> a great joke. It yeah. is a great joke. Yeah. It is a great joke, and, and you can build so much on that. You can right. build a giant story on that. I don't. I'm not familiar with Dave Evil. He was yeah. around for a while. He's still in Vancouver. I'm friends with him on Facebook. Oh, I don't think he's. Great. I don't think he's doing comedy yeah. anymore. No. Uh, no, I think you, I mean he, he was he he was a he was kind of a music guy who was doing some comedy and you know he's kind of you know the nature of the business. A lot of people are kind of in and out of it sometimes. Yeah. And you know we were all young. I'll just start now. Christine yeah. von Hagen, yeah, Christine von she Hagen. Of- Ophira Eisenberg was here. Oh wow, um, yeah. I mean, she she left here. I don't know if she. I think she went to Calgary and then she went to New York. Uh, but Christine von Hagen, she's hammering. Um, she writes for everything. Yeah, and uh, she's down in Vegas, down living living down in Vegas. Um, who else was around? You know that's a great. Uh, it was. Scene. It was. It was a good scene. Yeah. It was a good scene because there was a, there was enough people who were new who were starting out together um, who were also competent. Yeah. And 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 wanted to be professional comedians. They J.P. Were, Mass, another one. J.P. Mass, yeah. Alan Park a- and uh, Al Park, yeah, and um, uh, Carrie Talmadge who oh, moved wow. out here, yeah. yeah. And uh, I went on a vacation with Carrie Talmadge and Erwin Barker to Hawaii. And at some point, I should write a script and properly cast that movie because it was one of the funniest three days of my life. You should. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, Carrie pretending that he was, uh, the term I guess now would be mentally challenged, <laughs> and Erwin pretending to be his absent-minded caretaker <laughs> as they went from retail establishment to retail establishment <laughs> in Waikiki. And Carrie would walk into a clothing store and ask, if they had food, and then he would walk into a food establishment and saying that he was looking for shoes. And then Irwin would try to explain that there's no shoes, and, and that he'd get angry at him and start yelling at them. And the poor salesperson would be getting all upset. What's your role in this? I was standing outside, oh just trying not to laugh my ass. I've off. heard that story. Oh yeah, they used to do it all over the place. Yeah, we did it for an entire day in Waikiki. It was very entertaining because <laughs> we were all pretty pale guys, and the beach was way too hot. So That's we were just awesome. like, let's just go to cause trouble for the afternoon. <laughs> I want to play you a clip of uh, when Tim, when I had Tim on the show, Tim Nutt, uh, a year or two ago. Oh, yeah. And he talked about the beginning. It's just about a minute long. Uh, here it is now. So another great thing he did is he gave me, Chuck, and Glenn permanent spots on the Wednesday night. Like every Wednesday, you had a spot with the following caveat. If you didn't write three new minutes every week, 
you lost your spot for a week. That's pretty great. So we'd all be riding in Glenn's car out <laughs> out to Laugh Lines in New West, um, helping each other write the new three minutes. <laughs> On the way there. <laughs> On the waiting, way. waiting to the last 90, minute. 99% of the time, yeah. We, <laughs> so there's a there's – a, and, and I'm pretty sure I'm not telling – stories out of school here but the first sort of 20 minutes of glenn wool chuck Byrne, and me were all sort of co-written by the three of us mm-hmm. in these sort of and we would hang out we'd live in, we'd all living in the same house and right um back in the day where we had home home phones uh 90 of the time the person that answered the phone got to open a gig there used to be a gig on the island the tally ho and yeah every once in a while I know the tally yeah every once in a while dave would forget to book an opener so he just phoned the house and goes, can you get to the ferry by 3 o'clock? And whichever one of us answered the phone. So we used to just <laughs> almost fight each other to get to the phone when it rang. There you go. Is that true? It is. I got a lot more gigs than Tim because I had a car. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Tally Ho in Victoria. The Tally Ho in Victoria, my most, my most vivid memory. Oh, man. There, I have a couple of memories about the Tally Ho. One... Um, that uh, when I – well, they both involved when I worked there with Ian Bag actually. <laughs> um, uh, on our way to the show, I knocked on Ian's door like, hey, we're going to go to the show. And he opened the door. And I still to this day don't know entirely how he opened the door because the door swung open and he, he was standing there. And Ian Bag, if you don't know, is a is a tall, tall man, big guy. Barrel-chested but he's, guy. But he's, and he's hairy. Okay. <laughs> I did not know there's that. There's a lot of hair on Ian Bag. <laughs> All right. And he opened the door, and and he was holding in, between his thumb and forefinger of each hand, like on the corners, he was holding the the um, the face cloth from the hotel in front of his genitals, and he was completely naked. <laughs> and and but what it was is, I knocked on the door, and immediately the door swung open, and he was standing there in that pose, <laughs> and it, to this day it bothers me. How long was he standing there? <laughs> Just waiting, and. How did he open the door? That's great. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, and then they shut yeah. off the hockey game <laughs> so we could start our comedy show. <laughs> and they hated us. Yeah. That goes without saying. I used to be neighbors with Stu Scott, who I think had a, a hand in that at some point. Did Stu, you ever work with him? I, I never worked with Stu. Stu was a guy I I heard about. Yeah, sure. Because he, and, and, and he used to book a bunch of gigs. And um, people always called them stew runs. <laughs> oh, I, I just got back from a stew run. And to varying degrees of it went well or I didn't get paid. You had to bring your own sound equipment. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you're listening to What's So Funny on CFRO 100.5 FM in Vancouver. I'm Guy McPherson. Sam Tonning is also here, as he is every week. And our guest this week is Chuck Byrne, back in town for a few weeks, a couple of weeks, yeah, a few weeks. Uh, I'm doing some gigs in Abbotsford, uh, out of the Yuck Yucks. Oh, there, yeah. when's that? Next, next weekend. Next or? weekend. Yeah, I haven't been to that club, but I hear nothing. Here's but, your chance. Nothing Here's but great chance. things about it. <laughs> no, I'd love to go out next week. That's be that's a perfect time. There you go. Chuck Byrne is going to be headlining. Yeah, I don't know when the last time I saw you was. Uh, it's, other than it's been a while, I, I mean, a lot of the trips that I make back to Vancouver, I don't end up doing stand up. I end up just visiting family, or I've got my kids with me, so I, right. you know, I'm yeah. chained to them. Yeah. So, uh, Chuck, as we said, started in '94 here in Vancouver, so long ago that he was on comedy at Club 54. It's my first tape. <laughs> Is it back when, <laughs> back when we we needed tape? That's that's the evening at the Improv of Canada. Kind of, yeah. I, I I think you're 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 kind of slamming evening at the improv there Am a little I? bit. <laughs> well, Comedy at Club Fifty Four is is I think the the Vancouver equivalent of Comedy at Club Fifty Four would be if someone in um, I'm trying to think of a a suburb without without I don't want to say Surrey because Surrey is Abbotsford like, maybe Abbotsford yeah but it's 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 where it is in Toronto is it's it's outside of Hamilton. It's in Burlington, and and what it is is it's a nightclub. Yeah, and and Are it's you mean a, a comedy pretty, club. No, Just it's a, a nightclub, night club. and they do comedy shows there. To this day, they still do comedy shows there. And the TV show was a local was a local guy Ben Guyatt, and and he got the Hamilton TV station to do this show. So they would take the 
sound equipment out and they would shoot like four of them in a four of them in an evening four of these episodes half hour episodes in an evening so it was kind of like um a tv show of a road gig in a way ah um but it was a regular road gig so uh, the more regular a road gig becomes it starts to become like a club just because the audience gets trained up they know what to expect everybody you know knows the social cues of behavior for an audience yeah. and and all of that and so it was it was it was a good crowd like it, you you really couldn't do poorly and and if you look at the history of that show they booked everybody like and anybody mm-hmm. like if you were willing to come to Burlington you could do an episode of comedy at club 54 and that was we, when you got to Toronto i mean comics would tell you oh do a club 54 you need a tape right cuz you need a tape to be able to get an agent or to be able to show pe- show bookers or anything right. like that and but, good production and this qualities was, and this was yeah well yeah yeah, and 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 professional because back then, you know, you needed somebody with a handy cam, you know, who knew what they were doing. Right. And and then you'd need a, you know uh, to find a stage that had lighting that wasn't going to look absolutely horrible, and so to get a TV tape, basically as an entry level professional was rare, you know, because you know when you're doing an episode of uh, comics or comedy now, or you're doing an HBO special or somebody. A TMN hires you to do an hour or something like that. Most people have already been doing comedy for twenty years. I mean, now it's easy. Now you, with your phone, you can record your album. You can shoot HD video on your yeah. phone. I mean, it's it's if you get the lighting right, nobody would know it was just you and your buddy on a phone. That uh, Hamilton TV station also uh, put out Smith and Smith, didn't they? I have no idea. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna Sam say Smith I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say for the no first idea. time in a while. That was before my time. <laughs> Smith and Smith. That was uh, that. You know who it was? Who it was? What's his name? Uh, Red, Red Green. Green. But what's his real name? Somebody Smith. Probably. <laughs> it is. It is. And his wife Morag. I remember from that TV show. It's a great name. Is in uh, from, Ish. <laughs> from Hamilton. Wow. So they did comedy at Club Fifty Four. And still Smith going and on. Smith. It is the show. The the. the, 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 the Book show itself. Yeah, yeah the book show the is still going TV on. Show. And remarkably, because I did that in, uh, it would have been end of 96. It was on that first tour I did out east. Remarkably, uh, what, 21 years later, the audience still wearing the same outfits. <laughs> 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 or not so remarkably, if you know Burlington. So yeah. that comes up. It's syndicated right now. It's uh, Those episodes are still playing. Have you come across yours? No. Every once in a while, I'll get an email about something like sure, that. Yeah. Somebody, somebody, somebody uh, digitized it and put an old clip of me from Comedy Club 54 on YouTube. Yes, they did. Yeah. I, I don't Are you know. looking at it? No, not right now. Uh, I don't I know. will tonight I, before I, I go to bed. no <laughs> idea who they were or what their motivation was. Uh, that's what but God not. bless them. Yeah. You know. Why not? Yeah, you don't have a huge presence online. Like, you don't have your own website. Or I'm, at least I'm, if you do, I couldn't find it. I had one for a while. Yeah. I didn't like maintaining it. And then you got all the, Twitter, of course. Yeah, all Facebook. the social media yeah. came along. You can follow me at Act Chuck Byrne, or you can request to be my friend on Facebook. B-Y-R-N. Yes, B-Y-R-N. B-Y. Why? Why not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you, you have a credit to Last Comic Standing, don't you? Yes. I made the, uh, I guess, what would I have been considered in there? A local finalist? I made, I made, I made the episode. Right. You know what I mean? I was one of the comics they were going to have back to uh, to perform at night. Perform at night, and from there, from there, I was told to go home. Oh. <laughs> How did you feel about that? Uh, like, did you get work? Actually, up? you know what? At the time, I was upset about it. Uh, uh, after I found out I wasn't going through, I very much wanted to go through. I mean, the only reason you enter something like that is because you want to win the damn. That's thing. right. And did you feel that you performed well enough to, given everybody else there? Because sometimes um, it's political no, or they joke. No, I, I'm, I didn't feel that I got screwed over. I felt that I had a good set and I wasn't chosen. But I've I've never been one to to say, you know, oh, hey, I got more laughs than that person. Because also keep in mind that, you know, they're TV people. They're they're looking for, they're not looking for, they're not counting the laughs in the room. They're trying to think in terms of their audience and they're casting a show. Right. So I rarely take anything like that too, too seriously. Um, but I was upset about it. But also, that was the season where they they ended up. Uh, Sean Cullen was one of the guys that got through. Yes, and uh, and he made the like he ended up going to L.A. and I think it ended up being a half 
like a half season because of the Olympics. And so, and they also had them doing, it was when they were trying to reboot the show a little bit. So they had them like trying to do improv at a bed, bath and beyond and, and doing all of these other weird things. And, and it was kind of like, um, I watched my episode and then continued watching the rest of the season. Yeah. And as the season went on, I felt better and better about not getting through. <laughs> right. Dodged a bullet on that yeah. one. Well, not really, because either way, you know, like if people, if pe- when people are saying your name on television a lot, that helps your career. I guess so. Positive or negative. I guess so. I heard, uh, I heard that you're a guy who doesn't get worked up too much. Is that true? Do you, do you let the vagaries of the business get you? You just take no, them as not really, thing? yeah, not really. But I you've mean, always been that way. Well, I mean, there's plenty of a lot of people get into the into this gig. For a lot of different reasons. And for me, I feel at my best and at my happiest on stage making people laugh. It's the the easiest, most relaxed part of my day. I, I always tell people, because, uh, you know, one of the common questions that comics, how do you do that? You know, how do you get up in front of a room full of people and, you know, they're all expecting you to be funny and, you know, and then you have to be funny. And, and in their mind, the idea of that is terrifying. Um, and I, well, usually what I do is I just ask them what they do for a living. Well, what do you do for a living? Well, I, you know, I work at the Bank of Montreal. How do you do that? <laughs> yeah. Because the idea of working at the bank of, you know, working at a bank and being polite to people and making sure all my paperwork is squared away and doing that every day and it all has to be done on time and it all, you know, like it all has to be organized and I have to treat people with respect and, and I can't necessarily say what occurs to me or what I think of them. Um, I don't think I could function like that long term and and be happy. I just don't think I have the ability to do that. I think I would just be miserable. And so, you know, it's the same thing. It's just that's what makes me happy. Well, you you so you took to comedy really quickly. I've been a I was a voracious fan of comedy before I ever did it. I watched every single HBO half hour special that they ever released onto videotape. We I, we had a there was a my dad was living in Montreal when I was in high school, and I was going to school in Ontario. And I used to um, go to his place on vacations. And there was a great video store down the street, and it had a huge comedy section. It was in Montreal, and so there was a lot of there was some just for laugh stuff there, but they had all of the HBO stuff. They had every comic special, and I watched them all. Who who and stuck just, out? A lot of them stuck out. The guys I really like, uh, Newhart. Oh yeah, Newhart is a guy. Uh, he did an HBO special. No, but he did okay. plenty of specials, and I had his albums. Yeah, and uh, but Bob Newhart is a guy that um, you know. If you talk to him in a conversation, he isn't inherently funny. Like he, Irwin he Barker. He, yeah, he wouldn't strike you as a, as an inherently. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. If you talked to Bob Newhart uh, on an airplane for a half hour and you didn't know he was Bob Newhart, you wouldn't necessarily know he's a comedian. No, you'd he think wouldn't he's strike an you as a comedian. But he, but he's just such a craftsman and so good at what he did in his little area, you know, like the one-sided conversations and, and all of that. So he was just so good at it. And he didn't swear, and he wasn't talking about anything risky. He was talking about mainly day-to-day stuff. And it just struck me as, you know, this this guy can take the things that are just every day and make them brilliant. He doesn't have to come up with a crazy scenario. That that I always really liked, but you know, like Eddie Murphy, Delirious. There's plenty, plenty, of, plenty of comics of my generation who knew that at one point by heart. You know, there was a time where I listened to uh, Andrew Dice Clay because he was saying all the things that you know we had never heard before. So we, to be honest, we had never heard before from a white guy. We had heard it. <laughs> we had heard it most of it from Richard Pryor previously in terms right. of language and yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, as I got older, I got a bigger appreciation for George Carlin and 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 uh, Lenny Bruce. Although, to be honest with you, I, Lenny Bruce to me isn't isn't wasn't a world class comedian in my mind. Now, you know, people are people are already writing letters, but just because he didn't make me laugh that much. Now, a lot of that is time context. Yeah, you know, without Lenny Bruce, there's there's an entire you know family tree of comedy that doesn't exist so while i don't necessarily like his jokes i really admire his importance to comedy mm-hmm. um because of what he did when he did it 
you know, without without Lenny Bruce, there's there is no Andrew Dice Clay, there is no Eddie Murphy, there is no Richard Pryor. You know, like all of the the context of being able to kind of do what you want to do on stage goes away a little bit, so which you, seems to be happening again now. You just devoured comedy. Oh yeah. And so a, you you didn't stick to you didn't go. This is the route I'm going to take. I'm going to be like uh, Andrew Dice Clay or or no, Bob Newhart. No, you no, sort no. of absorbed them all and became who you are. But did your comedy evolve or change stylistically over the years from '94 to the present? Probably. I but, think I probably started off more jokey. Yeah. Um, because you know I was twenty twenty two years old or something. And and so I didn't have a lot of stories to tell because I hadn't lived much of a life yet. So I've got more stories to tell. So there's more stories in my act now, and there's much more context to my act because I've you know I've got kids. I, you know all all of the all of the, the the baggage of life is stuff that you can work off of. And when you're a 22 year old kid, the big difference I found is when I when, when I got married and had kids, the audience. Um, reacted to me differently because you would because you would because, talk about that because um, people younger than me understood that I had experience and people older than me wouldn't write me off mm-hmm. because when you're a 22 year old kid it's easy for anyone in the audience north of 45 to be like this kid doesn't know what the hell he's talking about and so as a result you don't you know like are you going to listen to a 22 year old kid talk about world politics in any real way no but you listen to a forty-year-old guy talk about world politics a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. And so, as a result, I don't know if my style has necessarily changed, but uh, how and what I talk about has changed. So, I guess the how is well, somewhat now, stylistic. Do you get the twenty-year-olds who write you off because you're to them an old guy? Well, when I get into a young crowd, I acknowledge that. Yeah, I mean, I acknowledge. Got to do like Irwin. Uh, yeah, I always acknowledge the situation, and and and. You know, and then it just comes down to um, proving that w- once you've established to the audience that no matter what you say, you're going to be funny, all of that stuff is irrelevant. If they, if, if the audience trusts that when you say something, it's going to make them laugh, if you can get that trust early, yeah. you'll do very well. I mean, I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of one line things at the beginning of my show that aren't necessarily jokes. I mean, I've been, this is one line that I've been doing for years is uh, it's nice to be here in insert name of town here, home of, I guess, most of you guys probably, right? <laughs> and it's not really a joke, it's kind of a way of saying something that just lets people know that. I'm relaxed. You should be relaxed. Right. You know, I'm going to be yeah. funny. Relax. It, so the key is to get them okay. to listen to you. One of them. Yeah. I mean, like, in, you know, like for the most part, you got a lot of things working in your favor. You got a microphone. You're the only one standing in the light, and every single buddy's, everybody's chair is pointed at you. <laughs> so at least at a club. So, you, you, you know, you, there are things working in your favor. But you can, you know, just as you can do well, you can screw things up if you say the wrong thing. You talked about world politics, and you do occasionally talk politics without yep. browbeating anyone. Like you have a philosophy I don't, I don't, on how you approach those I, kind of sensitive issues. If I can get away with it, I don't like to ever specifically tell someone what, what I think about a specific thing. I like to mention the thing. And then joke about it without my jokes or any, without my jokes uh, having any statement whereby I'm saying, you know, and that person's wrong because of this or whatever. I like to just notice it and then make a joke about it. If you do it in the right way, you can, you can, I, I had um, one of the first times that I felt like somebody might be catching on to me as a lady came up to me in Ottawa and she had she had the air of somebody who worked in government. And she said to me, she said, it's very interesting because you talked politics for our, for 40 minutes tonight. And I was in Ottawa and I, there was probably an election going on. So I, would, I ended up doing a politics heavy show that night. She goes, you talked politics all night and not once did you get political. <laughs> and, and I said, well, yeah, because I, I can't pick sides. And she said, it, 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 it was, she goes, I really enjoyed it. And she goes, but then she also said, but if you pay attention, you kind of know what your politics are. Yeah. 
And and I said, well, that's up to you to decide if you know what my politics are or not. I'm not going to tell you what they are. Now I'm a little more now that social media has come along. You're hard pressed to avoid having an opinion sometimes because uh, a lot of social media conversations are set up as um, if I have this opinion, it's because you have the opposite opinion. It's not because you know. I find social media is creating is creating an area where um, people really want to show what's different between what they think and what the other person thinks, as opposed to trying to find any kind of commonality between mm. what they think. Interesting. Yeah. Well, do you, on on stage, do you, do you have a point of view? Then you don't say what your politics are. You talk about politics, so presumably you talk about different uh, political parties and personalities. Yeah, like I mean, like I had I had a joke for years where um, I, you know, I don't do it much anymore. Although now that I'm bringing it up now, it's going to be a fresh in my brain, and it might come up as I said, you know, I I would love to vote for the NDP. I really would. The problem is I own property and I have a job, <laughs> right? Which That's a, which yeah, it, which says a few things. It does. Uh, yeah, without having to specifically say anything. Right, it's it's kind of a uh, uh, a swipe at the NDP, but it is also saying you admire them in certain ways because I you would them love greatly. to vote for. Who them? doesn't want to die in a gold plated hotel <laughs> or a gold plated hospital? Right. <laughs> there you go. Oh, Chuck Byrne, how could I do this to you? I've burned you. Such a great conversation. Such a great guest. Hey, first time. Solo in studio, and I went and ruined it by cutting off the last couple minutes. Yeah, as I said last week, summer got in the way. We have a uh, weird system where I have to download the, the tail end of the show at the radio station. Can't access it from home. And then I just didn't get around to it, didn't get around to it, and now look. We're cutting Chuck Byrne off. The great Chuck Byrne. I apologize to Chuck and all the Chucksters out there who uh, wanted to hear what he had to say. Because he had lots to say. I really enjoyed that conversation. But you'll never hear the last couple minutes. We can't get that back again. Oh, well. The next one. The next one. And all in, all of the others in the future will be in their entirety. I promise. Uh, yeah, I promise. I hope. All right. Thanks for listening as far as you did. And, uh, I bid you a fond good evening. Mm-hmm.